Hello, my name is Angela Kim, and I am a third year gender sexuality, women's studies, and American studies double major education minor. Hi, this is Sam Aguilar. I'm a third year community and regional development major, political science minor. My name is Vanessa Diaz. I'm a fifth year community and regional development major with a minor in gender sexuality and women's studies. And I'm Keith Williams, American Studies and Anthropology major with a minor in Communication. And we all attend the University of California at Davis. Today, we want to talk to you about the things we think are neoliberal deficiencies at the university. Public universities have been consumed by an increasingly neoliberal American society. The university acts as a capitalist enterprise as it invests in profit making over promoting the public good. As a result, the institution focuses less on the well being and safety of the students, most notably those of marginalized identities. The notion that neoliberalization has prompted the university to dismiss the public good can be seen in four overarching themes. The main themes of our individual work include the neoliberalization of UC Davis and public universities as a whole, the commodification of students, the investment in whiteness, and the perpetuation of rape culture in the university. Each of these overarching themes have issue components such as racism, sexism, and classism that are also pervasive issues in a larger American society. The arguments against neoliberalism which can be defined as the privatization of public works, it is that it has brought a profit bottom line motive to the public good. However, throughout history, it can be argued that neoliberalism has produced a great deal of progress and great benefit to society. For starters, the computer or tablet you may be scrolling on while watching this is an example of neoliberalism at its finest. The internet, the web browser, GPS, and a touchscreen display are some of the features that were public inventions that were commoditized through private corporate innovation. In addition, colleges and universities have spent decades relying on private endowments and donations to advance research and development at public and private colleges and universities. According to the 2015-2016 University of California Annual Report on University Private Support, UC Davis raised $132 million private dollars to assist with public initiatives such as helping community college students transfer to UC Davis, and what is the biggest private donation to UC Davis at $38.5 million, the UC Davis Eye Center, to further their research. So the idea of public good versus private bad should not be in debate. However, it can be asked, what deficiencies fester in a neoliberal culture? who was left out in this bottom line reality. All right. <laughs> Listen to me. Here's, yeah. all, here's all I want from you today. Uh -huh. This is it. This yeah. is all we got to do in this conversation. Okay. Just one, I have one simple goal. Yeah. I want you to admit that there is such a thing as white privilege. That's all I want. I know, I know. Lipsitz talks about the possessive investment in whiteness as above and beyond a personal prejudice. Whiteness is a structured advantage that produces unfair rewards and privileges for white people while imposing impediments for employment, housing, healthcare, etc. for communities of color. White people are encouraged to invest in their whiteness and perpetuate this racism in order to reap the benefits, resources, power, and opportunity that comes with being born white. There were public policies supported by the government that excluded communities of color from everything that American society deems desirable, such as good education, decent housing, political power, satisfying work, and a clean and healthy environment. However, white supremacy is no thing of the past. It is alive and well in our current day. Exposing white supremacy and systemic racism is not enough. People of all groups, but especially white people, because they benefit from the system, must work to eradicate the rewards of whiteness. With regards to the following readings of Teachable Moments and Specters of Race by Kevin Gaines and Susan Douglas's Enlightened Sexism, Sexism and racism is discussed in terms of the lack of accessibility both of these isms present. In Kevin Gaines' presidential address, he notes our society's obsession with incarceration efforts occurring in relation to black-brown bodies in contrast to white populations for the sake of profiting prisons. 
allowing us to connect this train of thought as to why minority students are a minority at UC Davis in comparison to white students. Similarly, Susan Douglas presents societal representations of sexist attitudes in what she calls enlightenments in her book, Enlightened Sexism. Douglas states common stereotypes of women that include only needing to be judged by physical appearances, only motives in life are men, women shouldn't be too strong in their demeanor or speech, and housework and child rearing are a woman's quote-unquote domain. These sexist and racist societal efforts and attitudes pushed me to think about whether or not UC Davis is truly something of public good. In economic terms, a public good is public, accessible, and equitable in terms of achieving. However, there's a long historical and social underpinning that people slash women of color, along with just women in general, have at some points in time been barred from institutions like UC Davis. In tying in Bennett Wisner and McCurgy's collection on commodity activism, we see that the neoliberal university attempts to capitalize on the diversity of its student body to attract more prospective students by distinguishing itself from the other universities. Bennett Wisner and McCurgy note that commodity activism allows activism, or claims to diversity and inclusion, to become a marketable commodity. More notably, when it comes to branding campaigns of the university, UC Davis uses the extraordinary stories of a handful of people of color in an attempt to validate their claims to diversity, all the while managing to maintain its investment in whiteness. Through this investment in whiteness, the well-being and the needs of students of color are not being met. The public good has been lost due to the attention that has been placed on profit-seeking. Once the students are admitted, the university has attained the profit and no longer needs to entertain the well-being of all students. Moreover, with this increasing number of undergraduates, it becomes harder to address the needs of certain groups and especially individuals. Dr. Curtis Marez wrote in Seeing in the Red, Looking at Student Debt, that debt confines students to the status quo by colonizing the future, tying present activities to plans for servicing its imperatives and limiting time for reflection, experimentation, protest, or any other unprofitable endeavors. Debt is thus increasingly coming to shape and limit how we imagine the future. He believes that student debt limits individual choice through the necessity of students having to engage in subject matter that will most likely assist them in their mission to pay down their debt as soon as possible. The time for experimentation, individuality, liberty, and discovery moves into the background while one fits size all practicality and hegemonic conformity becomes the ends that justify the means. For the marginalized minority, this translates to various divisions of the hypernated American having to retrofit their humanity to fit within the limited spaces of the dominant culture. Neoliberalism at this point isn't based on a free market system, but an open-air prison that limits opportunity. In a broader context, the commodification of students has ties to classism and racism due to the increasing costs of higher education. Financial capital lays down the foundation on which our society is built upon. Without money, it is a great struggle to maintain your well-being and the well-being of a family. To earn money, one would need a job, whether formal or informal, and to get a good paying job, one would likely need to earn a degree. But to earn a degree nowadays is also to allow yourself to accumulate thousands of dollars of debt. For many underprivileged students striving for success, this can be an enormous setback. A certain type of human capital is desired by the economic market, which includes education and a specialized skill set. But many social, political, and geographic factors also play into the ability of attaining a job. The institution itself has a history of being only accessible to those of higher social class. The historical prevalence still persists in the manners in which the university allots success in education. To cite the Carnegie Rule, which is presented on the university's Academic Senate page, and explains that for every four unit class, you should spend three hours for each unit. That is roughly 30 or more hours each week, depending on your unit load. If you're a student from a lower socioeconomic status who needs to work in order to afford living and school expenses, there's a trade-off between the hours used for academics, according to the Carnegie Rule. Hence, the institution is structured in a classist way to allow students who do not necessarily need to work a quote-unquote upper hand. 
whereas students from lower socioeconomic status make it work with their work and school schedules. The neoliberal Washington consensus uh, is supposed to be the expression of the triumph of these principles. Calls for is what's called minimizing the state. Now, if you minimize the state, you're maximizing something else. You're removing the state from some area of decision making, something else is moving in. Uh, well, what is it that's being maximized? Where is decision making power shifting? Neoliberalism has racialized the language of privatization so that all things private are white and all things public are people of color. White people work hard for their money, whereas people of color are mooching off of the government money and being lazy. You've heard it all before. The rich believe that they acquired their wealth through merit, hard work, while ignoring the advantages and privileges like education, inheritance, and especially class that help them secure their wealth. People in lower socioeconomic statuses begin to blame themselves for their failures, even though they cannot do much to change their circumstances in the first place. In a world that is governed by competition, the poor who fall behind become defined and self-defined as well-deserving losers. One prime example of the inefficiencies in the university is how the institution is guided to deal with issues of discrimination based on sex in education programs or activities that receive federal assistance. UC Davis as a public institution must abide by the following statutes because it receives Title IX funding. The following laws and statutes as read on the Education Amendments of 1972 states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. The issues this act addresses includes recruitment, admissions, and counseling, financial assistance, sex-based harassment, treatment of pregnant and parenting students, discipline, single-sex education, and employment. However, the aspect I would like to emphasize is the act seeks to address one pressing issue in previous years at UC Davis, sex-based harassment. In the year 2014, the Davis Enterprise released an article stating UC Davis as the fifth in the nation in terms of rate of sexual assaults and harassments. And while doing a cross-campus comparison between UCLA, UC Davis, UCSB, UCSD, UC Davis was ranked highest in terms of sexual assaults and harassments reported for 2015. Which comes to the question, if UC Davis has plentiful amount of resources on campus for students to seek support, why is there so many of these crimes being committed on campus? And how does the university plan to address, implement new strategies, or begin a dialogue about these alarming rates? Neoliberalism, as defined by David Harvey, is a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institution framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trades. Neoliberal doctrine applied to higher education, according to Henry Giroux, results in the corporatization and militarization of the university the squelching of academic freedom, the rise of an ever-increasing contingent of part-time faculty, the rise of a bloated managerial class, and the view that students are basically consumers and faculty providers of a saleable commodity such as a credential or a set of workplace skills. So those are concerns about the neoliberal reality that has taken over colleges and universities. Thank you to Professor Julie Z at the University of California at Davis for letting us do this. For Angela Kim, Sam Aguilar, and Vanessa Diaz, I'm Keith Williams, and we thank you for watching.